Today's episode of Poets at War is sponsored by the following. I'm Ian Wilson, and I create graphic art using primarily traditional methods, supplementing with digital where it's needed. I use a real pen, a real paper, a real graphite to make my art. I like to feel my art. I've always been this way. I love the feeling of a pen or pencil in my hand, the sound of graphite scratching paper, and I love the sight of a nice black line making its way across the page. So why choose traditional art over digital? Traditional art has an organic, natural quality that seems to be missing from most digital illustrations. The illustrated books and comics that were made in the days before digital have an excellence and staying power that is just as vibrant now as it was decades ago. These are the stories that stay with you. Dr. Seuss, Winnie the Pooh, Where the Wild Things Are. People still read these. I'm currently working on my own graphic novel series, Legend of the Swordbearer, and I've also had the privilege to draw graphics for two motion comic series, along with illustrations for a small magazine, Logos Sophia magazine, and various book covers. Don't let traditional art fade into the dust. Help me keep it alive. You won't regret it. Visit my website at ianthomaswilson.com for more info. Greetings and salutations. We were just about to have a time of wonder and excitement. Want to come along? We'd love to have you join us and Phil Lawler on today's Poets at War. See you in the trenches. Good luck. I know that's what you said. So, um, good luck. <laughs> I'm good either way. Yeah, somebody man. wanted really to talk am. to me the other day. She, the student who wanted to talk to me, she had to interview somebody who was a working writer for her class. Mm-hmm. And she said, Oh, it'll only be like 30 minutes. And it was two hours. So, <laughs> yep. It's the, yep. Way it, it's the way it works. It's yep. the way it works. Hopefully, we'll keep it to an hour. We'll see. Good luck. Yep. Well, I was a uh, I was raised as a mobile DJ, and I tend to uh-huh. have more of a production line way of thinking, even though I am a writer. <laughs> so it's you know that that kind of a thing. But <clears throat> so um, let's see, let's see where where to start. Let's see. Uh, well, you know, I've heard a lot. I've heard some interviews with you over the years, and I try to always do different questions because you get the same sort of mm-hmm. questions most of the time. But I feel like just mm-hmm. to set the stage, the main one to start with is how you were first. Uh, I say roped into on my list, but I don't think that's necessarily true. You probably wanted to get into writing, from what I remember, uh, mm-hmm. from a podcast. Yeah, and 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 into writing and directing and Odyssey, and how did that all come about well um i know odyssey wasn't your first but (laughs) i started out as a performer Mm -hmm. and uh and i really liked it and i did a lot of that when i was young i did a lot of it in high school um even before high school and uh, uh part of what we used to do in high school was put together these little review type type acts and so we had to write original material for that. And I really enjoyed writing the jokes and, you know, the original material. And I always enjoyed ad-libbing on stage. I never wanted to stick to the script. And um, so we, uh, you know, went away, did a lot of stuff, toured, toured uh, with some theater groups and uh, did a lot of acting and um, in, in different places. But then you realize, Groucho Marx said this too, he said, I realized one day that uh, an actor is just a spokesperson for the writer's point of view. And so if you want to show your own point of view, you got to, you got to write your own material. And, um, and so I thought, well, that's, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And so I, I started to do more writing, but then I, I came, I went out to California, we moved out to California so I could pursue uh, acting. And um, there used to be a, I don't know if it's still around or not, but there used to be a a um, publication out there 
that uh, was called it's called drama log and that's where all the actors who wanted to to find parts would look they would look at drama log and they, you know there was articles and other stuff but it was mainly auditions that's what everybody was looking for and um all the people i i'm back in arizona now after 40 years of living in california but before i moved out there everybody said you got to go out there you've got this unique look so everybody really likes the look that you have and it's going to be really cool and there's no, nobody who looks like you so I thought, okay fine that's cool so i'd go out there and, and i would read in drama log some uh, description for a part they were looking for and it was me i mean it was my height it was my hair color it was my skin color it was my everything everything was it was all me um my demeanor my my everything and i go oh this is great i'll get this part and i go to the audition and there are 50 guys who look just like me um and i thought well maybe i should try something else if i'm going to do this for a living and so i started writing and um i, I write little uh, magazine articles um I, you know I, I wrote a lot a lot of different things the first thing the first couple of things i ever wrote were um i, I had written a, sh a short story and sent it off to what used to be magazines that publish short stories they no longer exist now but um and then i also wrote a, a, an informative article about a film uh, processing company that i worked for at the time and sent them both off on the same day and about a week later i heard back from the short story magazine and the short story magazine people said this this, this was the letter that the short story magazine people said break your pencils you will never be a writer mm -hmm. That's, that's, that was the encouraging note that I got from <laughs> that particular publisher. And I was like, oh, wow, that's, that's bad. And then the next day I heard back from the other magazine where I had sent the informative article and they said, we really love what you what you've written. We want to buy it. So here's a contract for, for you. So <laughs> I went, oh, you know, you, you see how fortunes change in a day, just in, in a, in, in one day. And, um, and so I, I, I continued writing and would publish little pieces here and there in different magazines and whatnot. I went to, went to film school and uh, studied script writing. And uh, then a friend of mine, um, I was working at, a, at the same film services company, and this friend said, still my friend after 35 years, he said, uh, have you ever considered writing for the radio? And I said, writing for the radio? How do you write for the radio? You know, kind of, the radio is music. You know, nobody needs writers. And he said, well, there's this organization called Focus on the Family, and they just advertised that they were looking for a, a writer. They're trying to hire, hire a writer. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And I had never heard of Focus on the Family. I'd never, I don't listen to, I didn't listen to Christian radio back then. Um, and I, I'd known, I knew nothing about them at all. So just as a blind submission, I submitted a short script that I had written. And, um, I knew nobody had no in, inroads with anybody at all. And I submitted it to Steve Harris, who was looking for a writer. And he liked it. He called me up and I came in and that's how it all started. I was hired to do, um, I was hired to, do, uh, to write a lot of stuff, different kinds of stuff, newsletters. I, so I, I was the writer and editor for a newsletter called Broadcast News that went to all the stations that carry the focus on the family broadcasts. And, um, and I wrote, I wrote a lot of this stuff, a lot of articles and stuff, a couple of things for the magazine and things like that. And, uh, but my main task was, uh, I, I was hired to create radio drama. They had done a couple of radio dramas before they had some good response to it. And so I was hired to create radio drama and that's what I did. So that's, that's kind of the, sh the short, uh, shortened <laughs> version of how all that happened. I think, you know, all total, I, you know, from the time I was really young, um, and from the time I really started writing, which was, <clears throat> which was, uh, you know, in high school, probably took about 10 years, I guess, in order to get, to get, uh, to be a working writer, somebody who was actually hired to, to write. I, I, I did a lot of, in fact, I still have these things. I did, I, I, I did a lot of journal writing, just journaling on my own, uh, uh stuff that I never, you know, that I don't, I don't expect anybody to ever read. And if they do, the, you'd go, oh my gosh, this guy's terrible. Uh, <laughs> just because you have to learn how to, how words work. You have to learn how to put stuff together and how sentences work, how words work, how, how to get things across that you want to get across. And so I would do that. I just pages and pages and pages of nonsense, um, but learning, but it was all learning process. And I, I have those somewhere. I don't know where they are, but I have those somewhere. That's, that's, that's for the archives, you know, my, my little my little uh, uh, nook in the Smithsonian Institute one day. There you go. Be all of those little journals. <laughs> Love it. So, <laughs> yeah. 
so that that leads really well into the next question you didn't even know about focus on the family they have a very um specific ministry goal from the beginning uh with james dobson and everything else and i I don't know how involved you were in just you know your regular christian life in the area of culture and trying you know it was that was that a Mm -hmm. thing as an actor like you were trying to affect things yeah uh, for christ in a sense sure sure i mean I, i i had that i felt that really deeply um, that it, you didn't have to give up your principles and you didn't have to give up your m- morals and your Christian uh, worldview in order to be in the in the business. Um, and but, but you're surrounded by completely amoral people all the time, mm-hmm. um, e- everywhere, everywhere you go, all the time. The, the fact is, it's not just amoral; it's it's uh, you know, malmoral. It's really bad. Yeah bad people who who spend all of their time figuring out how they can how they can screw people that's what they do they, mm-hmm. you know they, they they like that and and that's what they that's what they're all about and it's a very cutthroat business it's very bad you know cutthroat business but then again you if you're around it long enough you find that there are a lot of people who feel the same way you do they just keep it to themselves right right and, um you know and and you find you find that they're usually um that you'll be able to find uh, that there are even companies, uh, you know, animation companies or, uh, or filmmaking companies, smaller places that that also, even if they're not expressly Christian companies, they still are. They want to be nice people. They mm-hmm. they like the niceness. They want to be nice people. They want to produce good product, and and uh, and you, you you find those people, and you know they're out there. They'll they'll be out there. They like he said, they may not be expressly Christian, but they're out there. But I had always felt like, why should we, you know, I, I didn't have this philosophy completely, um, completely formulated in my head when I was young. Uh, it took actually going and getting degrees in philosophy for me to understand what I was thinking before. <laughs> but the idea behind it was, uh, uh, why should, you know, God is the God of everything and God is the God of art. And why should we? Uh, why should we abdicate art? Why should Christians abdicate art? Because art has a tendency to make you feel more bohemian in your attitudes. Uh, you, you know, you kind of have to open your brain and you let let things flow and and all that sort of stuff. And all that's all that's true. I don't think that that's necessarily false, but uh, there are ways of doing that that are also Christian. You know, there are ways of doing that that are also submitting to God. Um, but if you look at, you know, if you read the, you, you read the Old Testament, um, I mean, the first, obviously the first like two or three chapters of the whole Old Testament in Genesis is all about creativity. It's all about God creating stuff, creating things, creating, 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 calling them good, calling creation good, calling creativity good. And One thing I always uh, point then, out real quick, one thing I always point yeah. out to people, the very first person that is said to be filled with the Holy Spirit in scripture, regardless of whatever you think that is, but the very first person to, us, to specifically be said to be filled with the Holy Spirit is Bezalel in Exodus, yeah. you know? That's exactly where I was going with this. So if you, if you read on into the next chapters of, of Exodus and Leviticus, you see that there are very specific artistic things that God wants the temple to look like, you know, take take this material and, and dye it this color and make it this length and do this with how you put the loops together and how you, the, you know, you make the staffs that keep the temple curtains up and make the arc out of this, make it look like this, put this up there, put that up there, put, you know, pomegranates here and that up there and all that. And then, yes, and then very specifically, he says, there are two people that I have blessed specifically. Here are two people that I have put into the, that I filled with artistic uh, capabilities. Here they are. Listen to them. I, mm-hmm. They they have my mantle. I put my mantle on them. They're the ones that are going to tell everybody else how how this whole thing works works together. They're the skilled ones. I have skilled them specifically for this. And so you know, it's like, well, wow. If you think that that means we're supposed to ignore art, that art is the you know art is the exception to the rule. God is God of everything else except art. No, this is this is absolutely the opposite of that. You know. Um, it's, it's the complete opposite of that. God uh, loves artistic things. Um, God created uh, an artistic world where it's a, it's a world filled with art um, uh, and artistic uh, beauty. And 
Um, I mean, take take somebody, you can take the, the most jaded person from the inner city to the Grand Canyon and have them look out there and say, is that beautiful? And of course they would, they, what else are they gonna say? Of course, they have to say, yeah, of course, this is magnificent, it's fantastic, it's amazing. You know, well, who created that? I mean, right. you know, that. Do you think that that was just an evolutionary process, you know, <laughs> that this would still be beautiful if we weren't here to enjoy it? You know, of course it would be. It would. It would. Of course it would be beautiful, whether anybody's here or not, because we didn't create it. Mm -hmm. Somebody else did. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so that, that that was always in the back of my brain that um, that why should we we shouldn't be we shouldn't be. Uh, running and hiding from art we should be on the forefront of making art and that's the way the church was historically of course was you know the church was the one who decided and made made great these fantastic cathedrals and and uh, and the wonderful paintings and um, music um, in the in the in the renaissance and earlier earlier and later than the renaissance the church was leading the way that's what it, that's what, what it was all about and then for some reason it, you know we, we got to the 1950s and the church said, "No, we got to run away from this stuff. No, it's all evil. We don't want to do that." Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't, I don't know where that came from, but <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm glad my generation were kind of on the spearhead of going, "No, no, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll sort of bring that back." And, and it was very. I have to tell you, I mean, we, when I met like-minded people, we all very much felt like pioneers. Mm -hmm. We all very much felt like, and of course, the the thing about pioneers is they don't get to enjoy anything. They're the ones who they're the ones who take on the the bad thing and then die, but pave mm -hmm. the way for people to come <laughs> behind them. Yeah, you know, and I, I kind of feel like that's what we sort of did. Odyssey was the only thing out there for the longest time mm -hmm. that could be could be called you know this this artistic program. And and now, of course, there's a, there's a million of them, and that's great. Yeah, the I, I was kind of leading into. Well, what one person I wanted to ask if he's crossed your path, I'm pretty sure he has over the years. Um, Doug Tenaple. Um, I that name is familiar. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Yeah, yeah. he he he's he's uh I think a little bit younger than you, not much. Um, but mm -hmm. he's he created Earthworm Jim. Oh yeah 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 uh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah okay yeah and so I I uh I got to meet him and talk with my him. Son, and my son loved that. I mean, my son yeah. loved that. He played that it's, all the it's, time. It was it's awesome. fun stuff. Yeah. Very fun stuff. But uh, he's he's a really interesting guy. And you and he are two of the only ones I know from that sort of pioneer period that didn't. I mean, I'm sure you had your periods of where you kind of hid away and whatever, but you two have always been more of the outspoken ones that I've really appreciated. <laughs> yeah, um, he, yeah. He's probably like several more levels than you, but that's a whole other <laughs> thing because he's, you know, the guy who created Earthworm Jim, like yeah. he doesn't care what you think. Sure. <laughs> but, sure, uh, sure. but yeah, the, the, I wanted to ask how has, you know, I, I call it the culture war. There's a lot of people have used that phrase before me. Um, but to me, uh, you know, and that's a big part of what Poets at War is about. We're, we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're artists in, in, in the culture war, and it's sort of mm -hmm. a, a general's report, so to speak, of, of everything that's kind of going on in the culture war, just seeing where yeah. we're at, talking about it as it happens. So, like, how has the war changed in your mind from, I'm, I'm guessing, early 80s? period roughly about when you sure. were coming in to focus on the family and yeah. then and then into now how has the culture war changed obviously we've lost some ground in some spaces gained ground in others where do you where yeah. do you see things well it's 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 pretty much it's a different world in many respects from the cultural standpoint so um you know the things that we were i you you see it in the program if you if you just go over the history of the program from from the early years to now um you know, I, I see fans talking all the time about uh, shows like uh, our, our our castles and cauldrons, which is a thing about Dungeons and Dragons, yeah. and and how uh, you know we were we were very much uh, opposed opposed to that. There was you know providing warnings about this these kind of role play RPG uh, role play, role playing games, and. Um, and now, of course, they're all quaint. They're just, right. They're just like there's not that big of a deal. Everybody plays them. It's not that big of a deal. It's not that. And I and I try to tell people because they'll talk about how silly that seemed. That whole that whole thing seemed. And I say, well, okay, well, you didn't live through the time. 
you know, <laughs> the time period was, um, uh, was much different back then. And you have to understand that we were not the ones who were, who were sounding the alarm about these, these games. We were very much caught up in the secular world that was sounding the alarm about these games. Mm. Um, Tom Hanks did a movie, a made for television movie yeah. where he took on the role that he was playing, the Dungeons and Dragons role that he was playing and ended up killing somebody because he thought he was that person. And, and that, that was not us. We had nothing to do with that. That was, that was all these other, other um, uh, groups of people who were really concerned about uh, the stuff that popular culture, the influence that popular culture was having on their kids in various forms. You know, then you had, you had Tipper Gore, who is Al Gore's wife, who started the parental music thing, the, the advisory thing, putting that label on record, records uh, because, because the records contained content that they thought was really bad. Um, and, the, and they thought it was responsible for kids going out and, and, sh and shooting other kids and hating police officers and all sorts of things that were going on. And I, you could make a case for that, I suppose. Um, there are always going to be people who are really influenced by the culture and, and so influenced by it that, um, that they, uh, they start worshiping the culture and doing whatever the culture asks them to do. Um, but, you know, most of us, most of us, <laughs> we have our things that we do and then we grow out of it. Uh, you become adults and you grow out of it. I think the vast majority of the populace grows out of it and says, okay, I got to be more serious in my life. I can hang on to this only for so long. And then um, uh, my, my obsessive, uh, I had two obsessions when I was a kid. The first one was the Marx Brothers. Um, I was obsessed with the Marx Brothers to the point where I wanted to be called Harpo for most of my life, so, <laughs> for most of my young life. I dressed like Harpo. I walked, I, was, I did comedy like Harpo. I did all, all sorts of stuff. And I really, really, I was obsessed with it. And I knew everything there was to know about the Marx Brothers. And the other one was Star Trek. Yeah, that was, you know, it's a strange combination of Harpo and Star Trek. Um, <laughs> but I was obsessed with Star Trek, too. And it was, it was, a, that was a big deal. It was a really, really big deal for all of us who were early Trekkies. Uh, we really loved that whole thing, um, especially those of us who were there from the beginning. Uh, really thought it was some, that was a great, um, and, and, and that was even more uh, like Dungeons and Dragons, because um, there really was a worldview there. I mean, Gene Roddenberry and, and uh, Leonard Nimoy basically were coming up with, um, with philosophical concepts that were worldview concepts. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and, um, uh, and, and these were things that people now are still involved in. You, you go to their, their trek, trek, trek conventions everywhere and people walk around. There are people who, who go to work dressed in Star Trek uniforms. You know, they think that they're part of Starfleet and whatnot. So, so there are all sorts of, uh, I mean, the culture has that kind of, of potency. The popular culture can have that kind of potency. Um, but as far as how much it has changed, I mean, well, you know, just take a look around you. You know, the things that we were worried about and concerned about in the 80s, um, in the early 80s and early 90s are, are uh, completely different than what we're concerned and worried about nowadays um, it didn't it didn't take long for the culture to really you know, to, to really um, in my opinion to really kind of cave uh, you know collapse in on itself which it has done now you take a look at the popular culture now with all the wokeness and all the intersectionality and all that sort of stuff and it really seems like it's just uh, collapsing in on itself um, and and maybe that's what's needed maybe that's what's necessary uh, but I feel like we're the older, we're the older generation who came of age in the '60s and the '70s, who kind of set the stage for all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's like I said, that's a really good example. I mean, look at the counterculture of the '60s and '70s; they were all oh, crazy. No, now you've got Neil Young, yeah. uh, who was at the van, <laughs> who was in the vanguard of saying, you know, screw authority, <laughs> don't do it, don't listen to anybody, don't do it, do your it's own thing. So do ironic. Thing. Now come along and think, oh no, you should, you should mask up. You should, you know, you should actually absolutely obey the authorities, obey, obey, blindly obey the authorities. This is, <laughs> this is, not, and calling that rebellion, uh -huh. you know, that, which is, which is just, uh, you know, which is hilarious. So <laughs> everything is, every, what, what I see now in the culture 
it's like you said, we've made some advances as far as the Christian culture is concerned. We've made some advances um, in, in it. But I, I hate putting the Christian culture on par with everything else because it should be above everything else. Right. Um, it's not, it shouldn't be that, you know, it shouldn't be that we just get a seat at the table. It should be like, no, no, we, we control the table. We own right. the table. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, and you should be asking us for a seat at the table. Um, but, but, uh, but things have gotten to the, like I said, things have gotten to the point now where it's, it's, uh, it, it's just become a farce. It's a complete farce. The whole, the whole culture is just crazy. It, mm. it's, it's gotten to, it's gotten to the point of sheer craziness now. And that I think is probably what has to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to go to a certain point where everything really collapses in on itself. And then from the rubble, like a phoenix, you know, mm -hmm. from the ashes, it, a, a new a new little life springs up, and um, and it should be a Christian life now. And it should be dominated by that. So that's we'll one see of the what reasons. Happens. That's one of the reasons one of my son's middle names is Anduril, Flame of the West. Yeah, you know, um, <clears throat> yeah. That, yeah. that, that's really the direction that I'm praying for and continuing to be excited about, honestly, because God's going to sure. do what's great for His people regardless of whatever happens well world, it's, you know? it's it's you know he's either in control or he's not in control that's mm -hmm. you know there's there's really not a, a there's not a kind of he controls this but not this no he's mm -hmm. either in control of everything or he's not in control of everything <clears throat> and he's either david milch said it uh, he, he said you know if, if god is anywhere he's everywhere and and so you have to look at him you have to look at it that way and right. i believe i believe he, he's certainly he's certainly in some places which means he's in every place and uh, and so we have to realize that that's what's that's really what's going on here, whether we like it or not, whether anybody likes it or not. So, um, and and just like Scripture says, then all of these things start becoming really pro more profound in Scripture, which which is you're either going to you're going to bow the knee one way or the other, you're either going to do it voluntarily or you're going to be forced to. So, it's much better to do it voluntarily. Climb on the bandwagon. <laughs> mm -hmm. I hear that. So. Uh... I allowed myself one question to geek out about specifics in Odyssey, <laughs> just because I knew sure. that we'd be here forever, just in, you know, if that didn't happen. <laughs> and I think it does kind of fit in with what you're talking about. There, there was, there's one moment, honestly, that stands above all the others in Adventures in Odyssey. And I know that you had a, at least a major hand in it uh, from, from listening to the behind the scenes and other things of that nature. Um, and I wanted to ask if one particular thing influenced that at all, but Blaggard's final stand beneath mm -hmm. wit's end. Yeah. That entire scene, Jack's talk with him, everything else is to me far more profound than any other actual conversion scene in any Christian movie ever. Um, <laughs> honestly, I mean that, um, it, that, that, that scene itself is the like if i had to point to one moment in adventures in odyssey that's it for me mm. simply because it, it shows good and evil so unbelievably clearly with nothing but dialogue and sound effects and it is yeah. glorious um so the thing that it always reminded me of um and i i found the poem later after of course i listened to it for the first time when i was young but um, I always forget the guy's name. I think it's Hen not Henley. It starts with an H, I think, but Invictus, the poem. Are you familiar? I'm not familiar. No, not familiar. No. Um, I may, may as well pull it up while we're here. I can cut some sure. of this if I need to. Um, but it's, it's short, but it's um, if you're not familiar, that's semi surprising to me. Not just not not because <laughs> not because you like, I mean, I may have dialogue. I, from I it, may but, have I may have read yeah, it. Uh, it is Henley. You know, at yeah. some point but, <clears throat> it's okay but, uh w william ernest it. hensley or, or henley from okay. 1849 to 1903 was when he lived mm -hmm. this is this is this is the poem out of the night that covers me black as the pit from pole to pole i thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul in the fell clutches of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud under the bludgeonings of chance. My head is bloody, but unbowed mm. beyond this wow. place. Yeah, I'll, I'll do the last last two stanzas. Mm -hmm. They're real short, but beyond this place of wrath and tears looms, but the horror of the shade and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. 
Mm. It matters not how straight the gate, nor how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Yeah, I, I, I am familiar with that poem now. Some of those, those stanzas do come out. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, you know, uh, it, it's interesting how you, how, how, um, <laughs> how you could take that poem, mm -hmm. you know, um, are we the masters of our souls? Well, Blackard certainly thought he was, you know, um, and, and, and that shows you what happens when you think that you're your own God, you know, uh, Doug Wilson up in uh, Idaho talks about this a lot where he, he's, he, you said, uh, you said he shall, who shall not be named. <laughs> he, he's, I, I love him. I, I think love him. Too. Wonderful. He's uh, you know, but he talks about this a lot about how we each have, everybody has a God and your God is, is the court of highest appeal. That's, mm -hmm. that's what's what your God is. And, and uh, uh, you know, for, for us, it's, it's the actual God. But for a lot of people, it's the state, or for a lot of people, it's the it's the demos, which is the people, um, or popular culture, or or themselves. And uh, lately, um, we we've seen it in our own society. Just recently, uh, God has become science has become God. You know, we gotta we gotta follow the science. The science is everything. Science is the science. Give all the power over to science. Give everything over to medical science. You know. And I look at medical science and say, well, that's God is a pretty piss poor one, isn't it? It's it failed sure is. miserably for the past <laughs> years. Why are we trusting the that opioid God? Uh, and, uh, pand uh, the oh, opioid. Oh, my goodness gracious. Uh, it's just thing. been. Yeah. Opioid been, crisis. Been, and, yeah. Most of, mostly it's been a joke. It's just been mm -hmm. a, a complete joke. And, uh, uh, but, we're, but, but everybody's like, oh, do we have to pay attention to all this? And I think, well, if, if there's not a clear contrast there, if we can't if we can't see that kind of contrast this is what amazes me now and it, uh, maybe it's just a function of getting older but I, I, you can you can see the contrasts far more clearly the older that you get they they really are they're they're not disguised anymore they used to be disguised when i was a kid you had to think through them a little bit more but the problem is that even the more <laughs> the more it's interesting the more blatant the contrasts are the harder it is for a lot of people to see them and, and they don't even realize that they, they, they can't tell the difference between better and worse anymore. They can't tell the difference between right and wrong and good and bad and better and worse and what's trivial and what's important. They can't even see that anymore. Um, and, and so we have a lot of, all of a sudden, we have a lot of work to do. You know, we realize that, oh man, all of a sudden we have a whole lot of work to do. Uh, just getting people to understand that what you're following is <laughs> really, a really bad thing. Why are you following that thing? It's just not a good thing to follow. Uh, why are you believing that? Why are you, we just had our, we just had the president of the United States come out today and his administration come out today and say, okay, everybody, all the Americans need to get out of the Ukraine um, because we think something's going to happen there. And if you stay behind, we will do nothing to, to help. We will do absolutely nothing to attempt to rescue you. Mm -hmm. How could anybody think that's a good thing? Right. You know, how, how could how could anybody think that's that? Regardless yeah, of whether you think it's a good or bad stuff. idea to have a war with Russia, the fact is you're running away with your tail between your legs, and I, I, man, you know, does it, it look bad. This is the second time in a year that this mm -hmm. has happened with Afghanistan. It happened the same thing with Afghanistan. It's like, well, wait a minute, hold on. You, you do do you understand the cowardly nature? even the appearance of cowardice that that that's a, the the people with the guns ran away first mm -hmm. because you told them to mm -hmm. the people who were who are whose job it is to defend the defenseless ran away first because you ordered them to mm -hmm. what is that what does that say about you what does that say about the the, the nation as a whole what does that say? It, it, it's, it certainly can't be said anything good. You know, his approval rating is in the, in the, in the crapper, but yet people, you know, I'm still questioning the, the 35 or 40% of the people who think it's not as bad as everybody. I, I, what more do you need to show how bad, bad this, this really is? I always go to the child catcher and chitty, chitty, bang, bang. He's like, lollies for everyone. It's like crack pipes for everyone. Exactly, Kiddy winkies. Exactly. Yeah. 
very much so very <laughs> much so it it, it, it is uh, uh, and, and we're seeing things like that being played out uh, those those uh, mythological stories or those fairy tale type uh, uh, shows like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, all those kinds of shows, we're actually seeing that being played out now. It's I mean, people wanted to person. cancel Christmas. How much more yeah. fairy tale kids, Dr. Well, Seuss, I mean, can they get? I'm like, <laughs> and, and and how are people not up in arms about this? How are people not? How are how are people not going? Wait a minute wait a minute yeah this that that is right yeah we should not be following this we should actually be bucking up against all of this stuff right and maybe it just you know you ask you know, how long you know what what is it going to take how long is this going to last how long is this going to take well i knew that and to keep bring it back down you know back circle circling back around to the whole blackard and jack confrontation um, i mean that's where you have a strong worldview that's where you have you know whether you're the connected or you're not that's the thing so I've become a lot more Calvinistic in my old age. And, and, <laughs> One of my questions is legitimately, are you reformed or what? Yeah, I, well, I think so. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think I'm in that camp. So it's not so much a bad word anymore. It's well, okay. It's, uh, the, the thing about it is, uh, you know, since we're there, the thing about it is what I find interesting is uh, um, how, how this, and here's another thing that I think is really, um, really interesting for me is how much uh, our artistic world, the artistic world is, is uh, a, a type of the real world, you know, mm -hmm. what, what we have. So um, we've been dealing a lot with this on Odyssey lately, where we have a story arc for a character who's losing her faith. She has a problem and she's losing her faith. And it's a six part episode, right? Well, um, you know, three three episodes into it, we're getting letters from fans saying, we really need to pray for this person. And I'm like, who are you praying for exactly? Right, right. <laughs> she doesn't yeah. exist. She's a fictional right. character. She right. doesn't exist. So who exactly are you praying for? What are you, what are you trying to, well, I'm, I'm just like, she, we need to pray that she comes back to God. But she, but she doesn't exist. She's not <laughs> real. She's a fictional character. You understand? Right. There is no this person. And she and I, yeah, but we just feel. I said, so, are you praying for the writers, that, that the writers of the episodes right. will, will you know, bring her back <laughs> around? Newsflash: Writers need villains. And I said, <laughs> and I said, I said, here's the interesting thing to me: those episodes are done. Mm -hmm. You're yep. you're you're halfway through, but we know the outcome. I know exactly right. what's going on, and and we're not going to change it. Mm -hmm. So whatever you, whatever you think you're praying for, the outcome is finished. It's predetermined. This is determinism. This is it. You, you know, right. This is it's right. all finished. It's done. Right. And I think, okay, well, for me, that's really deeply profound because I'm, I'm looking at that and saying, well, isn't that what life is like? Isn't that what real life is like? Isn't that, that to me is like, oh, confirmation of hmm, maybe Calvin was right. I get into the, you know, got, that, that led to a number of conversations that I've had with people about. We had one on um, Facebook they, not that long they, ago. Yeah, you they know? they want certain characters to be redeemed. They want certain characters to be to be. Can we bring back Rodney Rathbone and make him a youth minister? No. <laughs> Why? Why? Why not? I mean, wouldn't that be a great story? No, it wouldn't. Why? Right. Because Rodney was not created to be redeemed. Exactly. He yep. was not created to be redeemed. Rodney was created to be who Rodney is, and this is what he's doing, and that's yep. it. He's not yep. created to be redeemed. Mm -hmm. But what about Richard Maxwell? He was created to be redeemed. That's right. Yeah. There's certain characters that are created to be redeemed. There's certain characters that are not created to be redeemed. That's it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that mimics life. There are certain mm -hmm. people who are created to be redeemed, and there are certain people who are not. And we because have God is that. honored in that. <laughs> he he likes it. That's so, the way he to, likes it. You have to face that. Now, this very conversation is going to make <laughs> people <laughs> their, their brains are going to explode when they right. hear us talking this way you know because <laughs> because they just can't take it they just want to no that can't be the case that can't be the case you know god loves everybody and god wants everybody to be saved and god wants her well okay you know from from this from the regular calvinistic doctrine you can look at it and say okay well if god desires that all if that means everybody then god desiring something that he can't bring about makes them a pretty weak God, doesn't it? Right. Okay. <laughs> uh, so he can't, that can't mean all, I can't, all can't mean all there in that context. It means something else. Yep. Well, we have to learn, you have to dig deeper. You have to go deeper. You have to learn 
how to do this stuff. Look bro. at all but, those fruits and vegetables individually, yeah. Phil Lawler, in the grocery store. Look at every <laughs> single one yeah. of them. <laughs> yeah. It's well, it's it's pretty clear so, that all can mean that in every other language on the planet, too. It's just, you know. Sure, sure. <clears throat> I mean, yeah. But so I mean, I I I I think that um the Blackard series was very fun. It was it was it, it was very interesting to me that we had to, you know, in, in resolving that series, um, the climactic scene really was a conversation. It wasn't really the big explosions and it wasn't really everything else. Those are kind of, those are kind of, when you think about it, those are kind of frivolous. Mm -hmm. um, the only way that series like that can end is with, with deeply profound conversations as, as deep as we can make them, mm -hmm. um, you know, as deep as we have any knowledge of at this point. So, right. Um, so, I, I found that to be a, a really exciting way of writing that um, of writing that scene. I don't I don't personally. I know that there are a lot of people who probably disagree with this, but I don't think we've ever equaled that. Yeah, I, um, in, in, <laughs> I love in, everything y'all do pretty context. much, but like, yeah, that's you know, it's it's that, on another level. It's a it's a that was a very deep conversation that took us to a I, I had to go to a place that I don't I had, that at that point I didn't normally go to in order to be able to get that stuff. So. Right. But it's good. I'm glad I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I had to talk specifically about that. Now, going back a little bit, maybe even a little further back than we went previously, um, depending on when you got into it. Um, Narnia and Rings. And I, I know you probably have different uh, time periods when you were reading mm -hmm. them or whatever first uh, or, or, wa or watching them or whatever. I know you probably yeah. read them both first, but yeah. um, <clears throat> I read Narnia first, watched Rings first, but I've read yeah. everything. Um, so I, 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 th <laughs> those two things are huge influences on everyone who listens to this podcast. They're kind sure. of two cornerstones of everything that we believe even as like i have a very eclectic group of reformed people uh some eastern orthodox some catholics some you know just a weird little group of folks you know i was raised reformed presbyterian and so many mm. more people want to talk to me these days than they did oh, growing yeah. up because well, of that <laughs> absolutely because you know finally we're coming around to your point of view <laughs> there you go <laughs> so um but anyway um let me let me pause on that for a sec Let's, we'll go back to rings and narnia um i was this is more of a personal thing it may not actually make podcasts i don't know yet but sure. um i was raised atlanta georgia you know as a kid growing up i live mm -hmm. in augusta now um mm -hmm. and joe moorcraft was the one who baptized me and raised me as a preacher that may name may or may not ring a bell I but he was does, actually but i don't remember i don't remember you don't remember what from yeah it. he was yeah. a very big um he was like the voice of reform presbyteriandom <laughs> back okay. in like the early, early late 80s early 90s okay. uh, he was he was doug wilson in a sense back then okay. and he um ran for congress during that period state congress um i believe yeah. and he got absolutely eviscerated by it from <laughs> every every single end and I grew up in his, in his, in his church and went to a few other churches in between at various points. We helped plant the church, you know, all kinds of other sorts of things. And so it, it's so weird as a kid who is a millennial, I'm 31, yeah, 32, mm -hmm. excuse me, 32. So I was born at the very tail end of 89, grew up listening yeah. to Odyssey, grew up going to Joe Moorcraft's church. And then, um, like, now, looking back, I see all of my friends who grew up in the Christian school that was attached, I was homeschooled, the Christian school that was attached to the school, I can think of one that isn't, that their life isn't in the crapper. Right. And I'm si yeah. I've sat here and gone, why, why, yeah. why, why? Well this entire time yeah, this and, has been a big a big issue for us big topic for myself and some of the other folks on odyssey too mm -hmm. um, especially especially the older ones especially those of us who have been around for a while we were at the we were at the vanguard of the evangelical spring yep uh, odyssey was we were we were right there we were the points we were mm -hmm. like i said we were the pioneers we were the ones who were, who were going out there and doing stuff and we were 
we were feeling the fruits of our labors man it was big and it was good and we had political power and we had all sorts of stuff going on and we thought this is great this is wonderful look at what we can look look at what can look at what can happen and only uh, you know saying giving lip service to how great god was but really thinking that it was us that was doing this and um and so a lot of our a lot of the stuff that we did i think even on odyssey was let's wrap up all the problems that anybody has in a nice neat little bow at the end of 24 minutes and we were telling kids okay look here's here's a dilemma here's a real world dilemma that you might face in your life and uh and here's how to handle it uh, you do this and do this and do this and then we wrap it all up and everybody has a happy ending and they go home and the kids are going yeah this is fantastic great yay and then they go out to their school and they would face a similar problem not not an identical one but a similar problem and they would try to use what we told them to use on the program and it failed miserably mm. and uh, and so no wonder they grew up and went when they got when you started becoming more a thoughtful and how you looked at the world you started saying well this doesn't really work you know all these and yeah, you don't go back and read the scripture things. because you think yeah. odyssey is based on the scripture right this doesn't this doesn't <clears throat> there's work. no way how odyssey can be? err it's christian so yeah. um so we really when i you know i took up i took my own hiatus from the program for a long time and then i came when i came back one of the things that i i, I i've been talking about with some of the other folks is that we have got to stop giving everybody four we've got to give them two plus two so they can get to four mm. in the scripts. And, and um, that's a, that's a, that's a Pixar principle. That's how they, they do a mm. lot of their scripts. Um, and, um, and unless it costs you, unless it costs you, you won't appreciate it. Yeah. And so um, a lot of the scripts that I've been writing lately have, have come up with, moral dilemmas really big heavy duty moral dilemmas that we don't resolve as a matter of fact the most recent one that has just aired that i did was about it's called the dickensian dilemma and it literally leaves you with here's the dilemma what would you do mm. and that's it yeah <laughs> and then we don't dissolve and people keep writing me and saying are you going to give us the answer one of these days you're going to give us the answer right and i said no <laughs> i'm not well come on i mean we got to know how this is no I'm not. That's the whole. We got to start conditioning. You yeah. have to. Yep. You have to work for it. Yep. You have to work for it on your own. You have mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, if we give you the, if we keep giving you the answer, you'll never. You'll. You'll never. You'll go. Oh, okay. And then you'll try it. It won't work. You have to be tried by fire. You have to be. I know. And 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 a lot of the episodes that I've been writing have gotten a lot of bad pushback from the listeners. They've been. They, they don't like it yeah <laughs> they don't like they don't like this medicine <laughs> that i'm giving them i have no intention of stopping it be, no you know, they have need to it to the powers that be but you know the rydell revelations for instance i mean the whole the whole thing with i don't know if you've been keeping up with that but i need to get back real, into it i've not been able to afford because i have two kids but i'm working on it. <laughs> it it's a real bone of contention with a lot of people because they don't like the way wit handled that situation and they're really mm. upset with it and they mm. think it's bad and I say, well, you know, it's doing exactly what it's designed to do, which is get you talking. Mm -hmm. You have to figure this out. You have to, you have to learn that you, you have to, you have to figure out, you have to develop critical thinking skills. You have to be able to, to, to discern this on your own, because if we give you the answer, you haven't, you haven't fought for it. You haven't, it, it's cheap, it's cheap grace. And we don't want that. You know, you it's have to be able to, to figure this out. Yeah. You know, it's funny going back to me growing up, my mom and dad, you know, one of the things, you know, and, and to Calvinism, one of the things that made me realize early on, of course, Narnia is not infallible, you know, well, or not, not Narnia, <laughs> Narnia too, but uh, Odyssey, that's what I meant to say. Um, yeah. Odyssey is not yeah. infallible is actually Calvinism. <laughs> Because there are some episodes well, yeah. where there was a very obvious Arminian message, um, some more than others, you know, and then I think back to episodes like um, oh, Courtney breaks her leg. I can't remember yeah. the name. You, you know which one I'm talking I, about. I Off think yeah, she was a ballerina, right? She, she was a ballerina and she and, and she and she and yeah. she wasn't going to be able to dance again. And Mr. Whitaker right. actually describes it as a play 
where we yeah. don't know what our lines are going to be, you know, et cetera. And right. I'm like, yeah. mom, 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 my mom sat down and told me that's an, that's actually a really good explanation of what it is. And I think yeah. it was far more Calvinistic than anyone realized at the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I um, think so too. Yeah. <clears throat> but, uh, but yeah, well, that, you know, the interesting, just as a side note, the interesting thing about that is that you, we would, it's possible because I've done it all, most of my life. Cause I grew up in our Midian tradition. Mm -hmm. And it's very, but it's still very possible. This is what, this is what didn't make a whole lot of sense to me, you know, which is why I think I've really drifted more toward Calvinism, reformed church Calvinism stuff is that, is that, uh, you know, I, you pay lip service to all these things. God is the author. God is in control. God is doing that. It's a, that sort of thing. God is everywhere. God is doing this. God is doing this. And you say this to, to everybody and they all agree with it until you say, yeah, that's what Calvin said. And then they go, oh, no, 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 no. Servitus. Yeah, yes, yeah, come on. Yeah, exactly. They are just up in arms. But you can tell, you can, you can, you can go to any kind of Armenian church and say, is God, is God the God of everything? Well, yes, of course. God is in control of all of it. Yes, of course. We believe exactly. that. God is all powerful. God is this. God is that. God is everything. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's exactly what Calvinists believe. No, no, you heard it. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, well, <laughs> I don't know what. I don't know what to tell you about that. I mean, uh, we either believe it or we don't. And that's kind of where I, I leave it with a lot of people. We either believe this or we don't. Right. We either believe that God is all powerful, that God is in control, God knows everything, and that God has it all under control, and that it, 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 it stuff is actually getting better and better and better, whether we realize it or not. Right. You know, because God, that's what God wants it wants to happen. Um, it, it, you know, uh, we the people my generation say hashtag that post mill anyway <laughs> <laughs> no, i know it's just okay well that's all right <laughs> um but yeah uh going back to narnia now finally narnia yeah, and lord yeah. of the rings um i was read narnia can i just up. can i just tell you something yeah yeah i have i have never finished the lord of the rings reading it that's okay um i totally get I, it i have i have tried my best to to read it i get i i Use start with the first book. that's what i did <laughs> I start with the first book and I'm like, we're 200 pages into this and they're not out of the freaking Shire yet. I don't know. <laughs> get oh, yeah. on with it, guys. Oh, get I know. on with it. Will you get <laughs> to the adventure already now? Oh, I, this is the same thing with uh, the movie 2001 Space Odyssey. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I have seen the beginning and I have seen the end. Uh, you got the ape-like creatures at the beginning bashing bones and throwing stuff up in the air and they see the obelisk and they're worshiping and they're dancing around and everything and the bones go up in the air and then the spaceship starts their ballet they go around and around and around and we hear you know uh, the lovely uh, lovely ballet stuff like that and I fall asleep <laughs> and I wake up just in time to hear uh, Dave what are you doing Dave <laughs> hey don't do that Dave no Dave and then, and then the movie ends. And I'm like, whatever happened in the middle, I have no idea. I've never seen it ever. <laughs> right. Right. So uh -huh. same thing with, uh, same thing with the chron with the, not the Chronicles, but with the, with the, the Lord of the Rings. I'm like mm -hmm. reading and reading. I'm really trying reading, reading. And we get to Tom Bombadil's house and I'm like, why <laughs> Did they fall asleep and I fall asleep and it's like, okay, I'm done. Now the movies this mm -hmm. is interesting for me. I really enjoyed them. I enjoyed the right. movies a lot. I can watch them forever and ever. I know that the movies don't end the same way the books end. I know that there are a lot of changes that happen mm -hmm. um, in the in the movie from the books, but I still I still it was more just leaving stuff out. They did yeah. end basically the same, but yeah, yeah. The but the major themes I think are still the same in the mm -hmm. in the in the throughout the film. Uh, and and uh, and of course, even even if they're not, they had some really wonderful, incredible mm. themes in the film. For sure, um, in the films that that I really loved uh, completely. So so with that background, go ahead. What's what's your what's your Narnia <laughs> Lord of the Rings question? Well, basically, just what's your relationship? You explain Lord of the Rings. Yeah, uh, I'm just getting to to Narnia. I was read Narnia. I watched Lord yeah. of the Rings when it came out in theaters as a kid. Yeah, uh, and and then read the books later. But I read them with audiobooks, and that was uh -huh. the big difference for me yeah. personally, yeah. Um, because I can be doing eight hours of work with my hands. <laughs> and be able to sure. uh you know yeah, actually that's a good idea and i probably in. should i probably should try to do something like that i mean to, my son yeah my, i was gonna my, my I son, was, uh, 
yeah, go he, ahead. He bought he bought the audiobooks for me, and I and I just haven't read them yet, so mm-hmm. I haven't listened to them yet. So I should probably try to do that. There's two productions that are really really good. One mm-hmm. is a podcast form that a fan put together that was really really good. He has some of the music in it and everything of yeah. The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, and it's called An Unexpected Journey. Yeah. And then the other one is Robert Inglis is the other guy that he actually sings the songs in a oh, two, which I really like. So, yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah. Well, and uh, what's my, so my background with uh, <laughs> what's interesting about the Lord of the Rings, uh, we'll, we'll get to the Narnia in a couple of minutes and in, mm-hmm. in, in a minute, but the Lord of the Rings for me, the, the background, uh, and it's, it's a strange way of, uh, I'll have to, I have to couch this in its in certain terms. Um, you have never lived in a world that didn't have Star Trek in it, right? And you have never lived in a world that didn't have Star Wars in it, right? Okay, I have lived in a world that didn't have either one of those in it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so my perspective on those things are a bit different from your perspective on those things, right? Because I remember a day when science fiction was completely different than Buck Rogers and all that, yeah not just Buck Rogers, I'm talking about the concepts and the way that they were written. I'm talking about Ray Bradbury and Robert Heinlein right. and, and, and those guys um, who, who, were, who, who handled science fiction in a way that was, was much different than it's handled now, mm-hmm. okay? Much, much different than it's handled now. And the same thing happened with The Lord of the Rings. So The Lord of the Rings was, was, was popular at one point when it was first written, okay? And then it sort of went out of favor. It wasn't around for a long time. And then when I was in high school, it popped back into favor really yep. big time. That was back in the 70s that it mm-hmm. popped back in early, the early 70s when it popped back into Led favor. Zeppelin started so, putting random stuff in their lyrics. Yeah. Uh-huh. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so it was a different thing for me than it was for for people later on, for the, mm-hmm. for younger people like yourself, millennials and right, younger people. Right. A completely different thing um we had it I, the only way i can really describe it is it, we kind of got down to the raw part of lord of the rings it was not it was not the really well-produced movie kind of lord of the rings and the really right. well-produced books lord of the, and the well-produced audiobook for lord of the rings it was like the raw lord of the, you really had to you really had to delve into it and really kind of get into it and either you did or you didn't Mm-hmm. You know, either either you either you really liked it, and that was the camps. Those were the two camps. You were you were either the nerds who really really liked it, or you were the people who were like, "Nah, I don't have time for this." And it was the same. That was the same thing for early Dungeons and Dragons. They were mm-hmm. very much wedded together. It was mm-hmm. that kind of a thing, and and uh, and so that that was a completely different. That was a completely different mindset for, for me. That's why Lord of the Rings has a completely different mindset. Um, than it does for a lot of, I think, for a lot of younger people, um, because the world that you live in, you know, you said you're what 31 years old. Well, yep. what Lord of the Rings was what? Early I was 11. 2000s, I know? was 11. Yeah, when yeah. Fellowship so came out. You were you were 11 years old. It's been 20 years now. So you and that was your formative years. You this this incredible film came out. You know. Uh, and so, so that was that. You're going to have a way different view of that than than I I, I would, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so um, and and that that may that may contribute to why I just haven't I haven't read them. But I really enjoyed the movies quite a bit. I really and, and of course the, again the themes are are really wonderful. Now, I grew up in the church. I grew, I grew up in a Christian home, but I grew up in a Christian home that was remember the time period was we stay away from the popular culture. Right. You know, right. Things like. And so anything that smacked of popular culture even was stuff that you didn't you didn't do, and because uh, the Chronicles of Narnia uh, Chronicles of Narnia were fantasy books that had mm-hmm. things that well we just didn't read those kinds of things in my house so it was very much like you know no no that's not it, and and uh, and I grew up in an even more restrictive home, uh, um, theologically restrictive home because I grew up in a, in the Church of Christ. Mm-hmm. The Church of Christ was very, very. We don't, we don't associate with other denominations. We don't do this. We don't have instrumental music. We do, blah, blah, blah. and so um, it, it was trying to create its own little subculture within the Church of Christ, which is part of what my big. That was where I, 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 um, I had a lot of cult of, of it. But what was strange about that was 
Uh, we don't believe in instrumental music at all in the Church of Christ. We sing in four-part harmony, a cappella. Great, that's mm -hmm. wonderful. Uh, you know. But we don't care. Uh, you better not play a guitar in the church, but we don't care what kind of rock and roll you're listening to once you get out of the church. <laughs> yep. So, so I grew up with all these great classic 70s, you know, 60s and 70s rock and roll, and I was just, I'd listen to that all the time, and ah, that rock out, and then go to church and sing hymns. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. four-part harmony hymns. And, and, uh, and, but you better not bring up, you better not bring a guitar into that building. No, no, no. We just, we do not do that. That's like the worst thing you can possibly do. <laughs> I mean, this just doesn't make any sense to me. Not at all. Uh, even though my ancestors were, you know, part of the people who actually started the Church of Christ. So, um, I, I that, that's, that's just kind of the way it worked. So I came to the Chronicles of Narnia much later. I came to the Chronicles of Narnia uh, as an adult. In my early 20s was when I first read them. And of course, uh, I read I read C.S. Lewis's other books before I ever got to the Chronicles of Narnia. So the first one, first one that first book usually that anybody reads of C.S. Lewis's is the Screwtape Letters, mm -hmm. um, because it's the most famous book that he wrote. It was the one that got him on the cover of Time magazine. It was the one that was that everybody was talking about. It's a very about. provocative book, you know. Uh, and it's a very provocative book. It's a it's a really it really interesting uh, idea. Um, for for a story lewis said that it was the hardest book for him to write because he mm -hmm. had to get into the mind of a demon mm -hmm. which was always very difficult for a christian to do but it's a really interesting and provocative book and then the next one was um um what's the one where they're on the bus and they go down i forgot the title of it they Oh, they're Great the Divorce, is it? The hell. The great Divorce, the Great yeah. Divorce. That was the next story that I read of Lewis's. And I thought, wow, this guy really is interesting. And, and the thing that struck me about Lewis was, this is what I've been looking for most of my life. Because here's a guy who is really smart, obviously, and he writes these really interesting stories, and they're not preachy mm. in the least. They don't right. do the Christianese thing. They're not that stuff. They're really provocative, interesting, well-written stories. And, and, uh, and, and you can get a lot out of them on so many different levels. And I said, this is a guy, <laughs> where has this guy been on? I'm like, well, he's, he, obviously he was around. I just didn't, I was right. kept from him. And then, uh, and then of course, after that, I think it was the Chronicles of Narnia. That's when I read them and just fell in love with them. They're so, they're so wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so that was, that was sort of my background in, in, in terms of Lewis. And then, uh, and then, in, and when we were writing Odyssey, he, uh, obviously uh, Lewis, the Narnia, and all of Lewis was very influential for us. Then, and he's Paul brought Custer up literally I, sometimes the book that they removed to go into the computer room is the last exactly, battle. Like, yeah, exactly. And I think that the, another one was uh, Wit was reading one of the Chronicles of Narnia when he found out that his son Jerry had died. Oh yeah, he put the, oh, he put the bar after the book and never read that book again. It was just stuck up on the up mm -hmm. on the shelf on the bookshelf so um but um um paul mccusker and i were very big into narnia and, and into the the lewis you know the whole lewis idea of, of stuff and there was a big battle going on back then between uh, between a, a writer named catherine linskoog and uh, walter hooper mm -hmm. because walter hooper was you know the executor of lewis's estate he kind of and Linskoog was like really anti Walter Hooper. You know, she said he's just inserted himself into the narrative, and this is a big, big thing. You know, and, and it was it was really interesting how all that played out. And Paul got to know Catherine Linskoog really, really well, and I kind of got to know her by correspondence. But but Paul actually went down and visited with her and talked with her a lot, and um, and so we were we we kind of got caught up in that whole controversy for a little while. Whose side are you on? What's going on? And how does this work? And, uh, so it was it was it was a really interesting and fun time, and both Paul and I were kindred spirits as far as Lewis was concerned. Because when you read Lewis's biography, um, his autobiographies or any other biographies, one of the things that, especially in, in the, his autobiography, um, he, he talks about his childhood after his mother died, um, and and his adolescence and going into his teen years and whatnot, and they were left alone. His father basically went off and did his his uh, stuff as a barrister and he left the boys alone during this days and, and and he describes these wonderful summertime um, activities where it was just him and and, and warney his brother and and they would sit and read books all day long 
Mm -hmm. They would just sit and read books and talk about books all, all day long, all day long, all summer, all day long. And, and I thought, wow, what a great life. <laughs> that, that life just held so much appeal for me. I was like, wow, what a great life that would be. And we really, both of us were really like, oh, I wish I could do that. That would, wouldn't that be great? That would that be wonderful. And, um, so we would, we would hole up in each other's offices. We would, you know, go back and forth and just have these long, long, long conversations to the point where Chuck Bolte, who was the executive producer, would come in and say, you guys need to shut up and get to work now. <laughs> you go back and work. <laughs> like, well, this oh. is work. Don't you understand? We're talking to each other about this stuff and we have to be able to talk to each other so we can make this stuff happen in our scripts. So it was, mm -hmm. it was a great time. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. So uh, I only have three more questions and we're okay. getting close to the time, but I think it'll still be at least within an hour and a half, hopefully. Um, close, I hope, I hope you're, I hope you're still feeling the conversation. Okay. Uh, just making sure. I'm, I'm fine. Like I said, <laughs> good luck keeping it to an hour. <laughs> well, the, my next question, you know, we've talked a lot around this sort of question, but, and, and, and obviously, you know, you're of one generation, I'm of another. And there's a lot of people sure. in various generations who have all kinds of opinions on other generations. And I'm not asking for some kind of <laughs> hot take, but what are the biggest strengths and weaknesses as you see them to how millennials are approaching art, particularly Christian millennials, but you can wax philosophical on generally the generation. And how they're approaching art. Is that what you said? Yes. Um, and the culture war and everything else. Uh, I, uh, I, you know, I don't know that I have a, a big, a big set of, uh, you know, a set of opinions about that. Um, I'm so out of touch with what is popular with that group. Um, I, 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 I'm frequently, um, <laughs> you know, you think of yourself whatever age you, you may actually be, you always have an age that you think of yourself as being. In your right. Head. That's just kind of the way it works. And I, I still think of myself as being your age. Right. And that was, uh, that was kind of the age that I, my brain sort of stuck at, even though I'm more than twice your age. Right. You know? um, uh, and so I, I, so it, any kind of popular culture that, that was popular when I was your age is so different from what, what it is now. So I really don't know who, I really don't know who the, any of the people, and people will talk to about, about, well, what about the, this, this guy said this and this, and I'm like, I don't even know who that is. I have right. no idea who that is. And I don't know what they're famous for. I've never even heard their songs. I'm, I'm frequently, um, uh, I frequently embarrass myself when I say, hey, have you heard this latest song from such and such and such? Yeah, that was 15 years ago. Right, right, like, right. Okay, well, that's the latest. I, song for me, I still have that know? because I have two children. So yeah, you know, yeah. so like, yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I don't, I don't. Uh, the only approach that I have is, as far as you know, the only, the only opinions I have about how you guys approach um, your popular culture and and art is, I am. Uh, I, 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 you know, in saying that, I'm also a, a university professor who teaches, who, who has taught courses in popular culture and how to approach popular culture. But, but I don't deal with the, uh, the stuff that's au courant. I don't, de I don't in that course say, okay, let's take this, let's pluck this stuff out of the current culture and talk right. about it. I talk more about concepts and how to approach popular culture than I talk about the, the individual concepts you know I, we, I talk about what art is i talk about you know stuff like that and how we should approach that and uh and i think that i think that uh, the millennial generation and the younger people from the millennial generation is um i think you're i think you're trying to find your way um more than anything else i think that's that's the way it is um, more than anything else and perhaps more than previous generations and the reason why is because you have such um you have uh, access to such um, mass uh, outlets. The internet has changed everything. The internet has changed how, how everything is approached. The internet has changed how you think about everything. And, um, you know, it, it used to be that, uh, uh, for instance, a stand-up comic could do uh, one act. They work, they work for a long, long time to get their act perfected, their 45-minute, hour-and-a-half act perfected 
and they could play that act for a long, long time. Well, now that's no longer the case because all you got to do is play one, one, one venue where somebody tapes it and puts it online, and now you've got to come up with a brand new act <clears throat> because everybody's seen it. Yep. Well, uh, in many ways, I, I, we used to beg for things like that when I was young. <laughs> Yeah. A lot of my friends and I wanted to make films from, a, from the time we were in high school too. But our way of making films was on Super 8 film. Okay, most people don't even know what that is nowadays. Most people don't know what film is these days. They, 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 it's all digital. Um, you have this thing in your pocket. Most people have the, one of these and they don't realize you've got a whole movie studio in here. You've got a whole recording studio in here. Yeah. You've got a camera, a camera is, it's 50 times better than any camera I had growing up. Yep. It's a professional quality camera that you have on your phone. And you could be making it. If we had that when I was your age, I'd have been making films every weekend. Yeah. I'd have been out there just doing nothing but making films all the time. That's me with podcasts. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. It's, it's the same thing. Yeah. Podcast is another thing. You have the capability of, of doing so much. And and, and, and the real interesting thing is you not only have the capability of producing, but of distributing to the world overnight, yep. you know, you can do it right now. It all can happen right now. And uh, I would, I, we would have, we would have just killed for that. We would have, I, that would have been the, oh man, if we would, and I, and I get film students, uh, cause I teach in the cinematic arts department and I'm like, why aren't you, why are you here? Why aren't you out making films? You know, do yep. you have one ready to go this weekend? No, we weren't going to do that. I'm like, man, you talk about being handed all of this stuff and you're squandering it. Yep. Why aren't you making films? Why are you, why are you not doing this? This should be your passion. This should be what you want to do. You should be doing this. Don't you understand how difficult it is to master the art of filmmaking? Yep. And they're like, well, yeah. You know, so, so how do you think you get better at something? How do you think you master something? You do a lot of it. Right. You do a whole bunch of it. That's mm -hmm. the point. You need to get better and better and better at this stuff. And you make a whole bunch of mistakes and you make some really, really awful bad films when you're first starting out. And then you learn from every single one of them. So you make better ones. Exactly. You make better ones. And the same thing with podcasts, the same thing with anything. How do you get better at this stuff? You get better by doing a lot of it. Yep. Okay. And, and I said, man, if we had this stuff when I was your age, I, every week I would forget college. <laughs> I You'd be, be Steven Spielberg. Making, I, we, absolutely. I would have been making films every weekend. I would have been out there doing this as many as I possibly could, especially because you have a distribution network. Yep. You have the internet now. You have YouTube. You have all these things that you can distribute your work. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, I, I think that that's my biggest, uh, that would be the biggest take that I would have in, the, in, in what, you're, what you may not be doing, <laughs> may not be doing right. You know, is that use these tools? Man. Yeah. Use these tools. They're out there. They're they're great, and get better at it. You use them with the idea that you're getting better at it, not that you're just going to squander them by showing what your cat threw up. Right. You know, or showing you know how some kid got hit in the nuts because they were they swung a bat wrong. But hey, at least you know? you're doing that. Some people you don't know? do anything because they and have to people. do their perfect feature film you know yeah you know go, go make stuff i mean uh, right now i'm struggling with perfectionism and i've been doing this for 45 years so <laughs> i understand the idea of perfectionism but you can't let it control you that way you still have yeah. to go out and do the work um, wow. now as far as the art itself is concerned you have so much more to deal with i think than we had um, as far as uh, subject matter is concerned you have so many weird <laughs> things that you have to deal with uh, and, and that's just got to, that's, I have no way of, of advising anybody on that because this is, this is new. Yeah. That's the new thing that you guys are dealing with that we didn't deal with, um, was the idea of, you know, you have people out there who don't know if they're a, a boy or a girl. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> right. I, I am not equipped with, <laughs> 
I have not, I have, I have great, so I have philosophical knowledge and religious knowledge, but I have no way of, from a cultural standpoint of dealing with that. Right. Uh, you know, it, I, I wouldn't even know what to, what to say, except I'm, I'm still working my way people. through and, an a, a self-proclaimed asexual character on one of yeah. my stories, you know, yeah. someone who says they just, they don't have sex, you know, whatever, yeah. like they don't have, yeah. so I, right. I, I, I'm still working through that in my own mind for my own fiction you know and it's like i have ah. i have never ever been one to to put uh sex or even relationships into the things that i write i right. I, I am i am not uh, somebody who deals with things romantically right um who deals with romantic relationships in in my work i don't really do that other than um, eugene I, and katrina because you were well first. you know that, <laughs> and that was really not something that i i had I Much was to like, do with. okay, can we please get on with this? It's dragging <laughs> out forever. You know, please either get them married or get them yeah, broken up. Yeah, let's go. Come on now. You know, but but one thing or the that. other, why do we have to go back and forth with this? And I think the reason why is because I had a lot of friends who would do the same thing mm. in real life that Katrina and Eugene were going yep. through in their fictional life. I'm like, I am so bored with this. This is just... This is so boring to me. And so now when we have other other characters who want to get into relationships on the program, I'm like, I, I that's not something I even want to, I, I'm not interested in that. So right. No, I hear you uh, there. The only reason I have it is is the the subject matter of the thing, but we won't get into that. Yeah. But uh yeah, the uh the last last two I've got, uh we'll okay. just say one here. Um just the what are you working on now kind of thing i know obviously we've talked about odyssey some just <laughs> what you work on am, these days i am i am working on uh, young wit book five mm -hmm. um i'm working on the fifth book the fifth and last book in the young in the first young wit series we had five books and i'm working on book five book four is done and, um, and where it's in the galley stage and i need to look over the galleys for that uh, but we're trying to get book books four and five out this year so we'll have the whole set complete and everybody can can get the whole set and book five is just beating me up like you wouldn't believe it's just beating the crud out of me because <laughs> i'm trying to i'm trying to get it finished i really want everything else has been put on hold there's a bunch of stuff that i really want to do and i really need to do but it's all being put on hold so i can get this book finished and uh and it's just it's just killing me and the reason why is because it, you know it's the it's the last book we set up so much stuff in the first four books that we have to resolve and it has to be really really good right and uh and so i'm just i'm like okay well so that's i'm working on book five now and then i got two more blackard books blackard chronicles books that, that are coming out and i'm dealing with the climax i really want to get to read scene. those <laughs> the scene that you're taught that you talked about between Jack and, and Blackard is going to be in those in those books, Ooh, and uh, I'm going to expand it. on it a little bit. Um, and so I've got to get I'm, I'm working on those, and then uh, I've got we've got some other um, Odyssey irons in the fire that we're going to be working on too. I can't really talk about them at this point, but we got some other things that are uh, new and fresh and exciting that are coming up uh, for us. And then I've got another, uh, I started a video series a while back that it's just like a one minute daily, one, one, one and a half minute video series that I really like called Logophilia. And it's all about loving words. And um, it's, a, it's a fun little thing that I'm producing on my own, but uh, I need, to, again, I got to finish this. <laughs> I got to finish this one thing so I can get everything else done too. So where is that? <laughs> Logophilia? Yeah. Yeah, it's not out yet. I haven't put it out yet. Oh, that's still working why. on it. Yeah, dude, I'm get it out there. It. I, know. I know. I really I need to. <laughs> I hear you, but I'm excited about that too. I was like, "Why am I not subscribed to Phil Lawler on YouTube or yeah, wherever?" I and I looked, I and I, I don't see you because <laughs> it's not there yet. I haven't. You know, I've got that's like I've... called Doug to Naples and get him on you. <laughs> like his exactly. whole thing, his whole thing at the Fight Laugh Face conferences last time was. Uh, you you got a phone get on youtube otherwise you you are literally slapping the apostle paul in the face who would have killed for what he gave what you have <laughs> i agree i agree with him 100 a thousand percent i just got to get this other stuff done first so. um but yeah the, the last question i had is um i got one other thing to tell you after i finish okay. the podcast part um uh we have a smallish audience now, but it's growing mm -hmm. pretty steadily. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I've, I've been able to really kind of get steady growth good. going. So I'm excited yeah, about good for that. You. 
um they're very engaged folks i have a group called the wonder brood on facebook it's just a, a messenger group you know we, we talk with each other you know a lot of the people ian oh, yeah. wilson sarah levesque all those people yep. that i tend to run with yep. and um i wanted to say they're the audience you're speaking to now but thinking covenantally Mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of people binge listening to this into the future i'm I'm very confident in that because <laughs> there are people binge listening to it now that said why didn't i listen to this from the start you know there are people yeah. are telling me that now so what do you want to say not only to the people listening um not live obviously but yeah people listening now in their ears but also the people years and years from now who've, who are going through poets at war um story is everything because everything is a story. Um, and remember where you are in the story. Mm. Always remember where you are in the story. Um, no matter what's going on in your life, if you always remember where you are in the story. If you look at your life as story, stories have their own nature, their own way of doing things, their own way of unfolding. And if you look at your life as in terms of story, and you see that your whole day is broken up into little individual scenes and scenes come together for act one, which is the morning and then act two, which is the afternoon and act three, which is the evening. Um, think of your life in terms of story and uh, whatever you're going through, you realize uh, stories are not ending. They keep going, they keep going on no matter what and you can't stop them. Mm. Um, one of my favorite series is Firefly. Uh, yeah. I really love Firefly and uh, the, the movie Serenity has Mr. Universe in it. And he says, you can't stop the signal now. You can't stop the signal. <laughs> I'm now. constantly well, quoting that. <laughs> I, I, I have adapted that. You, you can't stop the story. Mm -hmm. You can't stop the story now. It's, it continues on no matter what it continues on. Mm -hmm. um, we're not in control of it completely. We're in control of parts of it, but we're not in control of it completely. Um, and it's, and it continues on and it will continue on until the creator of the story says, okay, stop. It's done now. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a new story will a new story will start. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, remember where you are in the story. Story is everything because everything is a story. Remember where you are in it. That would be what I would say to people now, ten years from now, fifty years from now, hundred years from now. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to go ahead and do my little wrap up, and oh, then I got and one, one more thing. Yeah, okay, go ahead. One more thing. Yeah, yeah, I would say one last thing too. And this is something that I'm really working on right now. Um, It's something I'm putting in book five. It's something that I'm really kind of working on. And it's the concept of this is what we do. This is what we do. Um, if you're a Christian, this is what we do. Find out what that is, and this is what we do. If you're a writer, find out what that is, and this is what we do. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how hard it is. It doesn't matter how awful it is. It doesn't matter how great it is. It's this is what we do. It's very Kantian. It's very duty oriented. This is what we do. This is what we do. So that's what I would also uh, say. I again, I haven't really fully developed all this, but it's been really playing in my mind lately. The re reason why I even say this, I'll, I'll just give you the story. I was on a plane last year, and um, we were headed someplace, and I got into my seat and I sat down and I sit on the aisle all the time, and I saw people coming on. And this uh, petite woman, um, smallish petite woman, was she had her suitcase, fairly large suitcase, um, but she was trying to get it up into the luggage bin overhead luggage bin, and she was having problems. And I was just about to get up to help her when a very big strapping young man behind her basically reached over her without a word, picked it up, and with one hand put it into the luggage bin. And she turned around and said, "Oh, thank you very much," and sat down. And when she sat down, I realized that the strapping young man had in front of him his young son. I didn't see him before. And as they passed by me, the son said, that was very nice of you, dad. And the father said, this is what we do. And he went on. And I said, that's a great dad. Yeah. That's a great dad. No preaching, no big lecture, nothing else. One sentence, this is what we do. This is yeah. what we do. And I thought that is what we all need to hear. Mm -hmm. That's what we all need to hear. And again, I'm putting it in the last Young Wit book series. 
um, a really wonderful character named Hattie basically confronts young, young wit and says, I, I, are you a Christian? Well, yeah, then this is what we do. She's, she's confronting him about doing something he doesn't want to do, but he should be doing. And he, she says, are you a Christian? Yes, then this is what we do. Ah, and if we understood that concept, we'd get along a lot better. I don't say that the world would be a better place, but I do say that we would get along, along a lot better in it. Yep. I hear that. Well, everyone listening, remember, be your family's bard. Do not turn to the right or to the left, and God will be with you wherever you go. Come with me in the trenches for the next episode of Poets at War. Phil Aller, thank you so much. You are very welcome. My pleasure. Hey, everybody. Uh, Peter and me here, just trying to tell all of you, thank you for listening to this episode of Poets at War. Phil Lawler was one of the number one guests that I've wanted to have on Poets at War from the beginning. It's one of the re- things that I've strived for. Um, I have a lot more artists I'd love to have on, and uh, I'm going to try to get them on here. Um, we're coming a long way with the video. I just made some major breakthroughs with that uh, video versions of the podcast. And uh, I just wanted everyone to know one big way you can help out with that is by going to joshuadavidling.com slash support and becoming a monthly contributor. Phil and I actually talked about 30, 40 minutes more than what you heard. And I had to cut like one or two small things out, but generally was able to keep most of it in there. So the director's cut version of this talk and interview if you're just dying for some more phil lawler because i know i was and i know he was enjoying time with me too you can go to joshuadavidling.com slash support and even just for one month become a monthly contributor and you'll get access to the director's cut of this episode of poets at war thank you guys so much for everything you do and uh stay busy in those trenches we got a war to fight oh you want to say anything peter Oh, grab the mic. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Bye. God of song, said the warrior, part the world, the world. Betray the one sword, at least thy right shall guard one faithful heart shall free.